So uh, welcome to part five of uh, our ongoing series with Dr. Fred Provenza. Uh, today, we're going to discuss another broad range of uh, topics under the themes, uh, hijacking the wisdom of the body, and then we'll move into discussion of how palates link animals with landscapes. Uh, please check out our uh, other videos on the Manitoba uh, Grazing Club YouTube channel. We already have part one to four with Dr. Provenza, and we have a, a, a bunch of other, I think, fairly interesting videos that we've put together this winter. Uh, so welcome, Fred. It's good to have you back. Um, this has become kind of a nice uh, weekly event to uh, talk about important issues in agriculture. So glad to have you back again. And and let's get right into it. And uh, since we do have a good amount of material to cover today. So welcome, Fred. Yes, thank you, Michael. And uh, I, I very much have been enjoying our, our weekly uh, sessions to have, have a little bit of a conversation with one another before the session and then during the session as well. Um, so we've couched these uh, six sessions under this broad title of how palates link animals with landscapes. And the idea of the palate is simply the mouth, the mouth of the animal, whether it's a cow or a goat or a sheep or a human. And, and the idea that, that what we eat uh, is, is very important in terms of the health of soil, of plants, of livestock and humans as well. And so we've, we've used that as a broad topic. We started out talking about change and how, how uh, persist, now that's the only constant. That's what's happening all the time and the, and the importance of recognizing and embracing that. We went on then to talk about let feed be thy medicine um, and with, with a focus more on livestock, perhaps, than on, on humans and the roles of plant diversity and the health of livestock. Then we moved into uh, let food be our medicine and talked more from a human standpoint about how palates link us with landscape. And so today what we want to do is talk about how those systems have, have been hijacked, basically. And way back, we, we made the point that when it comes to wild creatures, and that can be everything from a bacteria in our gut or in the soil to, um, to insects, birds, fishes, mammals. Nobody has to tell them how to eat or replicate. That is to say there's a wisdom in their bodies that knows what to do. Um, and then we went on to talk about, but with human beings, um, you know, we're constantly being told what and what not to eat. And what we're being told changes from year to year, decade to decade. If you think over your lifetime, how much what people have recommended has changed from things that uh, we thought were really healthful. Uh, let's take egg that's on that picture there, for, for instance, being something that everybody appreciated as really nutritious to something that was to be strongly avoided until nowadays, where it's come into uh, favor again. So the question we asked then was, do we lack this, uh, the ability to identify and select nourishing diets like the wild creatures do, or has that been hijacked? And uh, we're gonna talk today about the ways that that's been hijacked. We made the point early on that when it comes to this wisdom of the body, this knowledge that knows what to do in creatures, there are really three legs to the stool. One is the availability of alternative foods. And if animals, including humans, don't have a diverse array of wholesome foods available to them, um, there's no way that the wisdom of the body can be manifest. We went on to talk about flavor feedback. And we said that liking um, is more than a matter of taste. It involves these interactions between flavor and feedback. Uh, and then we went on to talk about the social cultural part of things. So briefly then we, we got into what is palatability. We said that it's this flavor feedback. Palatability is more than a matter of taste. Um, our liking for the flavor of food is being mediated by these tens of thousands of compounds that uh, plant and animal foods have 
And we talked about the primary compounds, energy, protein, minerals, and so forth. And then this diverse array of secondary compounds. And uh, we, we, at the time we were doing this, we talked a lot about um, how many studies we had done over the years to show for primary and secondary compounds that feedback matters and that the feedback is complex. And it depends on the availability, again, of what what's animals are eating, what kind of feedback they get. So we said flavor feedback associations involve these primary and secondary compounds interacting in a dynamic network of communication that unites cells and organ systems, including the microbiome with environments. Um, uh, let's see here. We, we, I guess I've made those points on the integration. On, uh, it occurs not only for nutrients, but for medicines. We talked about medicine effects. We said that it's extremely complex, involving tens of thousands of compounds. And um, we made the point that this isn't the, the way feedback's working is at a non-conscious level. It's non-cognitive, it's intuitive, it's synthetic, it's integrative. The body's integrating all this, all this information and then it becomes simple. Uh, it's, it's, do you like the flavor of this food or not? And, and goes back to palates linking us to landscape. So, but then we talked a, a little bit on the, the first time we came to this about what I would call feedback traps. And that's the idea of anytime you're in a feedback trap, there's an immediate positive consequence, but there's delayed really negative kinds of consequences. <clears throat> I remember we talked, uh, Michael raised the point about when we were talking about the only constant and how quickly businesses come and go, come into uh, existence and then go extinct. None of them last all that long. And uh, one of the things that we talked about a book called The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization. And in that book, he talks about feedback traps and the, the, he calls it the delusion of learning from experience. And the reason he says that is that he argues that most times we aren't very good at learning because the consequence is delayed in time and distant in space. And you can think of many examples, the delayed in time, credit card debt, there's immediate positive kind of consequences. I get this thing that I want, but then you've got this delayed negative. You've got to pay that back. We could think of that in terms of fossil fuels and climate change right now, immediate, really positive, but delayed kind of aversive things that are happening. We went on to talk about plants like local weed that we said it's really nutritious, comes up early in the spring of the year. Um, and so animals, uh, when they aren't given much choice, they, they come to really like local weed because of the, the feedback from energy and protein. But the problem is there's alkaloids in, in local weed that harm cells in the central nervous system. So over, over a period of, of a week, two weeks, a month, that's, that effect is occurring. So you animals get in a feedback trap. They can't learn that local weed is bad because they've learned it's good. We made that same point for ultra processed foods. There's immediate positive consequence of uh, energy uh, that's primarily energy sources, calories that, that are in that food, but delayed uh, negative effects related to obesity, diabetes, diet related diseases. So these feedback traps are one of the ways that, that our palates get hijacked from eating wholesome foods. Um, we talked about the Dorito effect, Mark Shaxter's book, where um, he was talking about how the flavors of meat and produce have become blander. And we really went into discussions of why that was happening. But at the same time, processed foods have become all the more resistible. So we've disincentivized real foods because they don't taste good made junk food all the more desirable. So, so feedback traps in that sense as well, and this ended us in some pretty tough spot. Um, you may recall I showed a video of sheep eating straw, which we know straw isn't all that nutritious, not that great of food. Animals will utilize it under certain conditions, but it's not great. But in that video, the, the animals are absolutely loving eating straw. 
And what we had done is basically what's, what's illustrated here, link familiar flavors with refined carbs. If you remember, we were drenching them with an energy source after they ate that straw and uh, that lured them and that lures us to foods by dressing them in known and like flavor, reinforcing it with a blast of energy. Um, and people, we made the point then, people in the, uh, in the food industry understand these kind of relationships very, very well. We didn't talk about this, but I thought it would be good to bring it into the end of the discussion. We did many, many studies that show that the nutritional state that an animal's in influences the choices it makes while it's out foraging on pasture. We did work years ago in New York on dairies, and we were looking at does what's fed in the barn influence food selection when animals go out on pasture? And we were showing that if you feed them high protein relative to carbohydrate in the barn, when they go out on pasture, they in these grass clover pastures, they avoid clover. Clover is highest in protein. They also avoid the most protein rich parts of the grasses. And so if you back off of protein in the barn and feed more energy, then they utilize the, the clover and the most protein rich parts. It's simply uh, protein energy ma ratios matter and animals are responding to that. We did a lot of work showing that if we provided supplemental, um, let's call it a supplement of tannins or saponins or alkaloids, just giving them, a, uh, giving animals a capsule, like we might take a supplement uh, in the morning at breakfast, that that influenced the selection of foods. We had pastures where we had trefoil, alfalfa, and fescue. And those are the secondary compounds that they contain. Well, if we gave animals a capsule of tannins before they went out to forage, then they ate alfalfa and fescue. They weren't interested in, in trefoil. That is to say, they had reached the limit of how much tannin they could ingest. And so they were, that was reflected uh, in eating the alfalfa and fescue. Same was true if we high saponins ate trefoil and fescue, high alkaloids ate alfalfa and trefoil. So again, nutritional state affects choices animals make while foraging. We also found, interestingly enough, that animals would use certain medicinal plants if they had internal parasites, but if we dewormed those animals, they no longer use those medicinal plants. So all these are examples of something that you might not think about, and I'm using this to set the stage um, relative to the foods that we have. You know, we have these ultra-processed foods, high refined carbohydrates, and then we add vitamins or, um, you know, what, whatever, minerals, vitamins, omega-3s. We, we, we fortify and enrich products that aren't, that we've taken all that out of them. And so a question that, that you get thinking about, well, given all that we've seen here, does that affect what we do? And certainly that's the case. There's good evidence that that, that, that affects us. So then we stick more on these ultra processed foods that have these delayed kind of aversive effects rather than eating wholesome foods that wouldn't have those some kind of effects. So, you know, in the 18th century, sailors with scurvy craved fruits and vegetables. And when you read the accounts on those ships and the statements that they made and their deep, deep, deep craving, and when they would hit landfall, how they would just skirt these things down, it just, it, it gets you realizing there's a wisdom of the body that knows what it needs. And uh, given wholesome alternatives like these that are shown here, why the, the sailors could rectify their deficit at least once they, once they hit land. Well, today those sailors could drink vitamin C fortified fruit drinks. Um, their scurvy would disappear along with their cravings for fruits and vegetables. Here's the kicker, rather than eat a rich array of phytochemicals, each sailor would consume a large quantity of sugar sweetened calories, which are gonna lead to, to uh, obesity, diabetes, um, issues with, with insulin and, and uh, glucose and so forth. So there's two kind of cravings then, and if you look up craving in the, on the internet or something, it's, you're mostly going to find addictions to refined carbohydrates, um, eating processed foods that, that are causing these rapid weight gains. 
you're not going to find much, if anything, talked about related to cravings for wholesome foods uh, in the sense that we've been talking about as we've gone through this thing here. We then went on uh, to talk about how this is this this um, we've lost the culture. We've lost the whole culture that would have guided our food selection to wholesome foods. And we made the point that these natal experiences influence food and habitat preferences in all kinds of creatures. It's the home field advantage, we said. We went on to say that that's why it was very easy in our 35, 40 years of research to show that how much of an influence mother had starting in utero, um, after birth with flavors in her milk and mother as a model. And then we went on to say, these are the same things that are happening in human beings. We uh, talked about Clara Davis's work uh, where she was showing the, the wisdom of the body in, in young, young people. And she's, she talked about the wholesome foods that she was offering and said the results of her six years of studies leave uh, selection of foods to be made available to young children in the hands of their elders where everyone always knew it belonged. And then we went on to say that that's not been the case from the food industry to the medical and pharmaceutical industry, including work that's been done with researchers. Um, we've really gotten onto the, the ultra processed ba food bandwagon and that's led to, to a lot of, of issues. And now from a transgenerational standpoint, as you walk around and look, look at, at our fellow human beings, have huge, huge issues that are transgenerational now. You see very young children that are already um, far overweight, if not obese. And, and you realize that this, this starts in the womb and it's going generation to generation. Um, we made the point as relates to that, that you have these uh, epigenetic heritable, you know, heritable changes in gene expression that are, that are changing cells and organ systems and setting as, a, as a bad as it is, setting the young child up to, to handle these high loads of glucose and, and so forth and so on. The, the last point we made that I wanna come back to today is that in all of this, there's this individuality and uh, each one of us is, is so different. We can be identified by our fingerprint. A bloodhound can, tra can track us by our odors. And uh, so when we look at inside at our organ systems, how they, uh, uh, their form and their function and how that influences our behavior, it's the same thing. We're, we're each so, so unique. And so, um, I might get away with eating more refined carbs than you might, Michael. I don't know if that's true or not, but my body may be able to deal with that better than yours or, or may not. Um, that, that can go with any kind of food. I may be able to eat more of a plant-based diet. You may prefer more of an animal-based diet. But the key point that we were making and I'm making now is that, um, <clears throat> Each one of us is, is, is unique, and each one of us needs to figure out what works for our body. We'll come back to that in, in just a minute. So we, we concluded uh, last time talking about what price do we pay when we ignore these transgenerational linkages to social and biophysical environments, and basically saying that what we need to do is to create cultures that are grounded in wholesome foods um, from, from literally from the soil through the, the, the plants and plant diversity to the livestock and health of the livestock and human beings and, and all the creatures that, that are across landscapes. I made the point that plants turn dirt into soils and that diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores and pharmacies for herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores below and above ground. And, and there's um, this these transgenerational linkages to that. So uh, with that, Michael, that's, that's kind of running back through some of the points that, that we've hit on up to this point, and then setting us up to, to launch into this idea of uh, uh, where we're gonna go today 
uh, related to hijacking the, the system. Uh, any points you'd want, want to make before we launch into that? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, just thinking while you went through all that, um, like if you think about everything you just said as a summary of what we've talked about uh, over the past four webinars is, um, it's kind of a summary of the last 50 to 70 years. It really, it really has happened in a, in a very short period of time. So it, it makes you realize that, that um, you know, when we talked about change right off the bat, it's, it's not just the, the type of change, but it's the, the speed of the change, the rate of change. And that, and that can sort of overwhelm either our, you know, adaptability, our ability to kind of, you know, deal with that change in a meaningful way or, which then sort of fit in well with what you said about um, that, um, that, you know, we, we are almost like hijacked by immediate positive consequences and versus, you know, those delayed negative consequences. And it's hard to, it's hard to balance those. It seems like kind of a great description of, um, you know, the last couple hundred years of the industrial revolution and even more recently, like say the past 50 to 70 years of the, of the green revolution, right? Um, and like yes. what we said over and over is it's not, that's not to be, you know, just hugely critical. It's just to be, you know, just to be insightful and kind of, and to, to honestly evaluate um, the, the past, you know, since the second world war. Uh, so, you know, we're so enamored with those immediate positive consequences. Like think about how, you know, just in say an agricultural sense, we have more food. And, you know, our history has been that we are based, you know, try to try to um, find enough food to keep going. And now we, we've been able to figure out how to grow more food and, and do that in a predictable kind of way. And that's wonderful, but we've maybe um, pushed those negative consequences, sort of kick that can down the road because we've We've enjoyed those short-term positive consequences. No, good, good points, I think. And, uh, you know, as we said, as we've gone along, trying to maybe now not, not throw the baby out with the bathwater entirely, but right. think about how can we think about nature as a model, go back to trying to understand how, how did natural systems function and can we, can we learn and integrate that back into what we're doing? Yeah, that's right. So you start to, like I was thinking, you know, the green revolution, that's been kind of the term used that, and we're still sort of in, but it makes you think that we're, we're at a turning point here where we're, there's a new revolution. It maybe hasn't been given a name yet. I don't know what to, I've been trying to think of a, the regenerative revolution. I don't know, but somewhere where we integrate all, all that we've learned in our understanding, but now kind of integrate more of the the biological understanding into that uh, to, to just be able to, to still have short-term positive consequences, but try to deal with some of those delayed negative consequences that are spread out over time and space and hard to hard to measure. Absolutely, and and to the best of our ability, which we are, we acknowledge we are limited. Try to think about. Um, what the implications, for instance, of regenerative ag could be, not only from a positive standpoint, but are there some downsides um, right. to, you know, just trying to keep our eyes open all the time. Uh, and I, I think as we talk to the, the emphasis on thinking about natural systems and what's allowed plants and animals and soils and all of that to, to function over the long haul could hopefully get us out of fossil fuel le loops, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and, uh, and help us to create, to create uh, hopefully healthy communities, hopefully individual, healthy individuals and communities as we, as we move forward. Yep. So yeah, that, that's, um, thank you for that. That made me have a, a bit of a new understanding of, uh, of uh, well, Kind of the, the consequences of say my lifetime and and if you think about it um, 
we sort of lived in maybe the, as far as, you know, sort of the like creature comforts anyways, we've lived in the best of times. We have plentiful food and warm houses when it's cold, especially lately when we've been in this cold snap across North America and all this good stuff. So we, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to kind of pick your side on that, right? You're either on one side of it or the other, but the truth of it is we try to, we sort of have to try to bring it all together and, and uh, just have a deeper understanding. Yes, absolutely. So we could say then that, um, you know, palates, our, our palates, our mouths uh, once linked us intimately with the landscapes we inhabited. You could go back to the ancestral diets and when you're hunting and gathering, you're, you are really intimately linked. I think it's interesting too, when I was um, reviewing literature 10 years ago or so on, on that, I, I was surprised to find that, that, you know, a lot of the peoples that, that were locally adapted to their landscapes, they didn't spend all that much time hunting and gathering. They had it down pretty well. I mean, I had this view that they're, you know, always at the edge of starvation, blah, 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 maybe not that extreme, but that, that they, you know, it was tough and so forth. It, Boy, everything I read uh, was saying that wasn't the case. They, they had a lot of leisure time. They, it, life wasn't so bad as we may maybe think. But at any rate, they were their palates were linked with the landscapes uh, fundamentally, huh? And then we come to nowadays and what we were talking about, um, you know, just take meat, meat, milk, eggs, and fat and think about over your lifetime how and and to today how those how those items are viewed. Now I'm going to show you a video sec segment in just a second here that I think captures all of all of this. And you know you have nowadays from the science community right on down to to different religious communities to to uh, right down across different groups of you know you should eat only plants you should eat only meat at the other extreme so you have all these all these controversies and again i would not to be a broken record but i would say in the end it's up to each individual to figure out with with foods and health what what works for for them it's it's an individual deal but let's 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 show something on this controversy part of things and uh let me do this video it speaks for itself we're so happy to have everyone home for the holidays. Your dad has been cooking all day. But a braised bacon wrap with my famous apple sage stuffing, the last one. None for me, honey. I'm on a diet. And you can see butter braised because I'm very free. I'm lactose intolerant. I'm gluten free. No stuffing for me, honey. I'm all fine. I don't eat meat anymore. It's a discussion with chicken. Just not like these. Is that free rain? Give it try of natural causes. Was it an assisted suicide? Because that is the most morally delicious. Nothing for her. She's just difficult. Dig in. Brought to you by Canada's Water Corporation. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I mean, that, that, that. Yeah. That absolutely ca captures all, all that's going on nowadays. Uh, go ahead, my yeah, and, and it's great that you guys put <laughs> Canada's Liquor Corporation. Uh, <laughs> but twenty-two minutes does good stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, it's perfect. So it's illustrating, though, and, and it is humorous, but it's influence. It, to me, it illustrates this idea of. You know what? What when you think of yourself, this self, whatever that, that self is, what is it that you you actually? Um, what is it that that self is? I guess basically, and you you think related to food. Let's let's start with food. You have this influence of mother that starts in utero and early in life, and then you have your your family, and then the community and the culture. And then you have all that, all that being manifest in that video we just saw. All, all that's uh, being illustrated. So um, here's where we come to. You know, we've made a point that flavor feedback is non-cognitive, intuitive, and synthetic. That's the level that that's working on. But the key point is that the cognitive, rational, analytical. That is to say, what we're hearing all the time. You know about 
animals raised in feedlots or meat versus plant or all those things that they brought up in the video. All that's at the cognitive, rational, analytical level. And that can override these flavor feedback kind of associations. So um, that's where I want to go here with for the next next little bit on this business. And there's a study that I was reading about here a year or so ago that was talking about vegetarians. And again, I'm not saying uh, I'm not trying to say a diet should be one way or or the other for people. Again, it's up to the individual. But I've I've talked with with several people over the years, and I, I didn't even set out to talk about this, but they, they mentioned, you know, well, I went vegetarian for five years or 10 years, and, and they described the experience, and they described the experience of eating meat again, and for those particular individuals, it was absolutely overpowering. Their body was telling them that, that it, uh, basically, it needed meat, that meat was, was their, their liking. So, these studies, well, they were pointing out that while vegetarians report a lower desire to eat meat compared with, with people who eat meat and plants, their neural activity reveals an inherent craving for meat when you're doing brain scans. And to me, these findings highlight then the dissonance between acquired beliefs and attitudes, um, this cognitive, rational, analytical part, and these inherent need for nutrients contained in meat. Um, let me build on that a little bit. And I wanna start, there was a, a psychologist in the US uh, named Paul Rosen. And I don't know if any of you read The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Um, Michael Pollan relied a lot on work that Paul Rosen did over his career, really, really interesting researcher. And the title for that book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, was really a title for a, a scientific paper that, my, that uh, Paul wrote years ago. But he got really interested in, in uh, disgust, why we come to find certain foods disgusting, why we come to strongly avoid certain foods. And one of the issues he took on was fat. And so he, he did a series of studies on that. And I'm gonna just show you one part of that, which is a survey. And he asked people, which food would you take if you were going to be stranded on a desert island for one year? And those are the choices there that are on the screen from bananas to uh, peaches, corn, alfalfa sprouts, spinach, hot dogs, and chocolate milk. And what he wanted to get at with this survey is, uh, you know, we, how, to what degree are you being influenced by fat phobia as opposed to what would benefit your body most? And so when he found out what people said, those um, numbers in red are the percentage, 42% said bananas, 27% um, said uh, spinach, 12% uh, corn and so forth and so on. But the key point here is that the two foods that would have helped those people to live the longest, even though those aren't great choices, would have been the hot dogs and the chocolate milk, and nobody wanted those. And he was just making the point within the broader research that he'd done of how powerful um, what had happened with fat had become in influencing diet food selection. You know, in fact, in the grocery stores here in the U.S. now, you have to search to find full fat kind of uh, products, whether it's milk or butter. And, you know, we trim most of the fat off of meat. And yet fat is what we're coming to appreciate from, from research nowadays. And some of the pushback is that no, fat isn't toxic. Fat is really good for us. And... Uh, and our palates were telling us that for forever. I, you know, when you eat um, a steak that has some nice fat on it, it's the fat helps to make that delicious, the marbling. Butter compared to margarine, that, there's no, no comparison. Same with whole milk versus um, artificial stuff. Well, when you trace back um, 
to where this fat phobia began, really Ansel Keys gets a lot of the credit and different people have written books about that. But, you know, he ran some really broad scale studies. He had a hypothesis that fat and um, <clears throat> cholesterol were what were linked with heart disease. And so he set out to test those. The problem was that in some of the two major, major trials, the data didn't support his hypothesis. There, there was no evidence that, the, of, of anything bad happening, but he buried those data. They were only published a few years back, actually. They dug them out, published it, and uh, really powerful publications that they wrote. And they said, you know, as complex as all this is, we better have humility. And definitely we have to accept when the data don't fit our hypothesis. But you think now, this many years later and the, the effects, which moved us basically away from some wholesome foods in our diet, satiating foods, toward, again, several factors going on here, but moved us more and more toward these ultra-processed foods in the diet and uh, horrible, horrible outcome uh, related to, to that. How fat stays toxic, <clears throat> you know, there, there are groups of scientists that still very strongly think that fat, fat is bad, especially saturated fat, and that we should be moving, especially in food in the Anthropocene, the Eat Lancet Commission Health on Healthy Diet from Sustainable Food Systems is really about eating uh, fruits and vegetables, so nuts, fruits, vegetables, those kind of things with not so much meat and uh, in the diet and certainly not, not red meat. So just trying to say that these kind of things have major influences. And I was talking with a person last week that, that who was saying he has a, a friend who's really uh, following this literature, but she still has a hard time eating fat. And that's how powerful that influence has been uh, over the years, even though now um, she, she's appreciating some of the findings, she still has a hard time. Well, what we're saying about fat, it's true with, with sugar as well. And Many, many years ago, John Yudkin uh, made the point, pure, white, and deadly, how sugar is killing us and what we can do to stop it. And he was absolutely trashed by, by industry, um, uh, academia, people in academia that got involved in that, papers that were written that were touting the benefits of sugar and, and the adverse effects of fat and, uh, and so forth. And so it really, uh, you have a convergence of different kind of information from authorities, quote authorities, that led us down a path that, that wasn't, uh, wasn't good at all. So what I would say then, uh, going back from the ancestral days when we were hunting and gathering and eating wholesome foods, or even when I was a young child and, and the old time people I knew had come over from Europe and stuff, still really sticking to their cultural diets and very, very healthy um, and in tune with the wisdom of their body. We, we stopped listening to that and yield to advice from authorities. So experiences influence then what we perceive, how we believe and how we behave. And that, that's for all of us. I'm not saying I'm any different at all. I, I think of this quite a lot given what, what we've studied and what we're doing, but let me illustrate how that is. Uh, when I was writing nourishment, I reviewed literature on this topic and there are many, many, many examples. I'm gonna give you three here that illustrate the point, but in this particular study, they were offering people a piece of meat and the key is that it's the same meat. It's coming from the same animal, the same cut, so we're not, we don't have differences in meat, but where they said the meat came from strongly influenced the way people perceived that meat. Meat samples um, were paired with descriptions of animals raised on a factory farm or a humane farm. When people were told they were eating animals from a factory farm, the samples looked and smelled less pleasant to them and they tasted saltier and greasier power of what we believe to influence what we perceive and then what, how we, we behave. Um, many people believe they have adverse reactions to, to wheat and to gluten. And certainly some people do. There's no question about that. So I'm not saying that. But 
um, you know, at the Mayo Clinic, they've done studies where they look at uh, are do people have sensitivity to gluten or not? But what they find, and here's the key study, is that people who don't have any sensitivity, but who believe that they do, they respond as if they do have a gluten sensitivity. And when they run studies where people are fed high gluten, low gluten, or no gluten food, um, even when they receive the no gluten food, they have pain, bloating, nausea, and gas to a similar degree. So it's what they think, these nocebo effects, what they're, um, what they're believing is influencing how their body is responding. And this example is simply meant to say this is happening at a really deep physiological level in terms of of uh, hormones, neurotransmitters, all, all the physiology of this. It's not, quote, just in your mind. The mind is, 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 uh, has all of these kind of factors that are influencing it. And so there's this hormone, ghrelin. It's referred to as the hunger hormone because it affects appetite and it plays a key role in the rate and use and distribution of energy in the body. So it's an important one of many important home rooms that are influencing our response to food. And they were running a study and what they found was that ghrelin decreases after an 80 calorie milkshake that's labeled indulgent 620 calories, but not after an identical milkshake that's labeled sensible 140 calories. So what's on that label again is influencing the degree to which ghrelin is being released and how people are, are responding to that. So um, power of what we come to believe, of authorities to influence what we come to believe, what we perceive and how we be behave is, uh, there's just a rich literature on that related to foods. And so then that makes one think, well, how, you know, how do I get in touch with my own body? How do I try to, um, Weed out all the noise. That is to say, if you listen to any of that, if you don't, then you're probably, you may or may not be okay, but that, that's an issue for many, many people. It goes beyond that though. And I wanna use an example, two examples here of people to how it's, you know, food is just one part of health, right? There, there's, there are many factors that influence health uh, social factors, our relationship with one another, with our family, with our community, um, through to our activity in the day, where we live, what we do. Um, so food is just one, one factor in that. And I want to broaden the conversation out just a bit here. And there was a man, John Whitley, and he's, he's still alive to this day. I followed up on that. But <clears throat> Years ago, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, which is basically a death sentence. Uh, so he was determined to beat the odds and he enrolled in this trial where half of the people got an experimental drug, the other half got a placebo, nobody knew what they were getting. But every afternoon, John sat in his apartment and he took the drug and he told himself this. He's in a meditation basically and says, this is a miracle drug, it's going to save my life. Well, um, the trial ended and John went, you know, he's visiting with his oncologist as things went along as they all were. And he went to his oncologist and his oncologist said, got fabulous news, John, you are cancer free. There's no evidence of cancer in your body. He said, but here's the, here's the deal, John, you were in the control group. You got the placebo, you weren't getting the drug. So to me, it's another illustration of the power of what we believe, what we think, what's in, what's in, in us to influence, um, to influence how we perceive and what happens to us in this case related to disease. Let me build on that, that even more. And uh, you know, you might think back to when you were a young child, I'm, uh, thinking about this series on Netflix, and, and from Green Gables, I think it's, a, it's about Prince Edward Island, actually. It's a, it's a wonderful story, but it's illustrating when you're a young, young person and an adult as well, the power of what, 
of people in your life and peers and so forth to influence it to influence you for better or, or for worse. And this book here, Dying to Be Me, The Journey from Cancer to Near Death to True Healing, is really brings that point home and how conflicted people can become, young people and then into adulthood. So Anita was raised in, uh, in a Hindu family, very strong Hindu family. Um, but she had a Buddhist maid who would give her different views on, on what, what she was being taught. And then she was attending a Christian school where the, the children there would give her totally quite different views. In fact, when she told them she was a Hindu and had these beliefs, they said, well, you're going to hell. You know, so I mean, so we may or may not um, take that literally at this point in, in our life. I don't, certainly. But, um, you know, as a young child, you, you can very strongly believe these things. So that carried right on through to her early adulthood. And uh, <clears throat> these experiences early in life can stay with us throughout our entire life. No question about that. And so after losing two friends to cancer and a diagnosis of lymphoma herself, she began to study everything she could about holistic health and Western and Eastern healing system. She started on, on this journey then that would take her from cancer to near death to true healing. The near death part, let me just mention before we, we go on. So she had a, a near death experience where she died and went into the, into the, the, the transcendent. And she says in this book, she said, I had a choice to come back or not. I chose to return when I realized that heaven is a state, not a place. I, I make that point specifically because I want to come, come back to that. Heaven is where, where we, heaven and hell and all the gods are where we are, not somewhere out there, basically. So she, she is trying these different Eastern and Western healing systems and nothing's, nothing's helping her because basically she's not centered. Her, her, her mind and her way of being is, is still not centered. So when none of that works, she traveled to India to follow the healing system of Ayurveda. And she, she started working with, with a guru there who, who really helped, to, helped her to get centered um, psychologically as well as physically, um, centered on a diet, but, but really getting her to... to to tap into, into her, her herself, basically, and to find the healing there. And, and she became healed. She was doing really well uh, over, that, over that six months to a year she was there. And so she went back to Hong Kong and looked fabulous. Her friends were telling her how good she looked. But then she, she started to tell them, well, you know, how, what'd you do? What'd you do? And she started to tell them about the Ayurvedic regime. And here, because that's totally different from what's happening in, in uh, China or in Hong Kong uh, and different belief systems I've talked about. So it's something that's unfamiliar. And she started to get these fear-based negative responses, which given her prior history, put her into a tailspin. So, being still strongly influenced by others, she began to experiment with other ways of healing that are more common in, in Hong Kong and China, traditional Chinese medicine. But because of its conflict with Ay Ayurveda, again, you know, the conflict like never ended with this lady. In traditional Chinese medicine, you're encouraged to eat meat, especially pork. In Ayurveda, you're encouraged to be a vegetarian. Meat's the worst thing you can eat. So all this is just continuing to impinge on her. In the end, her organ systems failed. She slipped into a coma with death imminent. That's when she had the near-death experience that changed, changed her life. Um, and what she concludes is that after years of trying to meet everyone else's expectations, um, she realized as a result of her near-death experience, she alone held the power to heal herself both physically and spiritually. That inward journey to get in touch with the wisdom of her own body is what, what she finally realized. And uh, so let me, let me build on that point here just a, a little bit. Um, 
years ago, I don't know how many years ago it was now, 25 maybe or so, I was on the way back from the airport in Salt Lake City, going from Salt Lake City to Logan. It was late at night. I was listening to a radio channel and they were talking about this program uh, that played many, many years earlier, from 1951 to 55. Edwin R. Murrow was a host of a radio talk show titled This I Believe. Now that was happening after World War II during the war, war the Red Scare here in the States during the McCarthy era and the, the tremendous um, the fear that gripped this the U.S. during that time period and they're talking about that and what Merle wanted to do was to give people a chance to speak from their heart about what they believe as a way to try to open a conversation across the country and to try to to deal with this, this tremendous fear that was overcoming the, the country. And so they, in the end, they, they put together a book, The Personal Philosophies of 100 Thoughtful Men and Women, uh, titled This I Believe. And uh, no book here in the States has sold more, at least it's when I was looking into this, the, uh, only the Bible sold more than that book. So it was great. And listening to these people talk was fabulous. Um, about what they believed. And there, but there was one guy in particular, really, really just um, couldn't believe it. He said, you know, I can tell you what I've been taught to believe by my family, my church, my community, my country, so on and so forth. But he said, in all honesty, I don't know what I believe in the absence of all I've been taught. And I thought, you know, now here's a guy that's really on a journey. He's really, he's really realizing the influence from when we're very in utero and early in life that all the, the social cultural things can have on us. Um, so, you know, I've often thought we identify with our family, community, culture, religion, profession, politics, countries, all of what I refer to as the I am's. I am, you know, I am a, I am a professor. I am a, a whatever it is. All of these uh, these different kind of uh, inflection. But if you think about that, that's a trap momentarily inflected in the here and now. If you're born and raised in a different place, all or a different time, all of those I am's change, and it gets you realizing. Hmm, what I think I am probably isn't it at all. And so what is it that I am? And you come to realize that when we transcend all of the I am's, we come to I am. And um, I've been reading this past winter a couple of books related to this topic. And in this one here, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, it's titled A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment. That's really what, what, what people who talk about enlightenment are talking about is transcending all of the I am's and then realizing what I am is. And he says in there, he says, the word enlightenment conjures up the idea of some superhuman accomplishment, but it is simply your natural state of felt, emphasis on felt, oneness with being. And he's using being there rather than God, because he says, you know, we have so many connotations that we have for that. And he wants to get away from those, all the different connotations that, that we have. And so words like being, absolute, transcendent are more value neutral in that sense. But he said, it is a state of connectedness with something immeasurable and indestructible, something that almost paradoxically is essentially you and yet it is much greater than you. It is finding your true nature beyond name and form. Now, I'll talk more about this in this last, uh, in the last presentation that we do next week, Michael, on, uh, on transformations of, of, of consciousness, but this, this really gets, gets linked to that. He says, the inability to feel this connectedness gives rise to the illusion of separation from yourself and the world around you. You then perceive yourself consciously and unconsciously as an isolated fragment. Fear arises and conflict within and without becomes the norm. 
So I guess if you took all that we've been talking about in these last five sessions and tried to put a spin on it, it's, it's to recognize this, this oneness with, with one another, with the landscapes we inhabit, and then ultimately with the ground of, of our being. We are, as they say, we are that. We are one with the transcendent. Um, so the separateness in, in the field of time and space is the illusion, the awareness that I am resides in each of us. And we'll pick up on that a bit more in the last one. Um, to, to wrap this up though, I like this quote by Aldo Leopold. He said, there's spirit, two spiritual, spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing the breakfast comes from the grocery, the other that heat comes from the furnace. To avoid the first danger, one should plant a garden, preferably where there's no grocer to confuse the issue. To avoid the second, he should lay a split of good oak on the andirons, preferably where there's no furnace. Let it warm his shins while a February blizzard tosses the trees outside. So he's recognizing both the physical and the spiritual aspects of our, of our being here on earth. And you know, there's only a small fraction of people that own farms or ranches. So we, we can't all be farmers or ranchers, but anyone who owns a small plot of lot, land, and I, I'm talking here, including lawns and, and so forth, we can all become, we can all become farmers or ranchers in that sense. We can, this is the head gardener here at our place, my wife, Sue. This is where we live in Ennis on an acre and a half. There's a before and an after picture. And, um, you know, we've planted herbal, vegetable, herbal, medicinal gardens around the place. We were raising chickens on the place. Um, we've planted over a hundred berry producing and other kinds of, of shrubs, not only for our own use, but for, for wildlife species. And so what that does, I think, is do what Aldo Leopold said. It gets you back in touch with where your life, uh, physical part of your life is coming from. It links us back, and I think it can link us back health-wise by growing and eating wholesome uh, plant and animal foods with wonderful flavors and that are nourishing our, our bodies. Uh, we, can, we can all do that. And then when you think here in the US of all the money that's spent raising lawns and gardens, it's, or lawns, uh, pardon me, it's unbelievable. Over 300, over 30,000 tons of synthetic pesticides at a cost of well over 2 billion, not to mention all the herbicides and fertilizers to weed and feed our lawns. You know, in this picture here, there is a little bit of lawn that was put in before we bought the place. We don't put any fertilizer on that lawn yet. Look how green it looks. Why? It's infested with clovers, with, with plants that are fixing nitrogen for the, the, the grass that's in that lawn. Uh, over 800 million gallons of gasoline. The gas spilled <clears throat> refilling lawnmowers is over 17 million gallons, 1.57 times the amount spilled by the Exxon Valdez off the shores of Alaska. So that links back to our whole thought on Fossil fuels and what's happening with that, we don't have to be in those loops. Then in the arid west, residual water use outside of the home is 30 to 60% of total water use. Depending on the estimate, 7 billion to 9 billion gallons of water are used each day for suburban irrigation of lawns and golf courses and so forth. So this is taking this to a personal standpoint for, for each person and saying, you know, we can be farmers and ranchers. We can do what we were talking about could, could be valuable, uh, thinking about how to, to farm and ranch in the image of nature. We can do that same thing in, in, our, in our yards. So I'll conclude by saying we've made an art form of dining, but tabled all these larger questions over the last century or so. Eating is participating in endless transformation as plants and animals are killed and eaten. And I want to make a point here uh, relative to the debate over vegetarian versus, uh, versus meat eating sort of things. If we consider consciousness and sentience to be a part of awareness and perception, then both animals and plants are conscious and sentient. Um, it's true, while the inner lives of farmed animals 
depend on the species. Each one has its own, his or her own uh, nature and his or her own life. The scientific literature on everyone from chickens to cows to you name it leads to one conclusion. Farmed animals are beings who possess many of the emotional and mental traits of human beings. Um, that's where, as we talked earlier, the feedlot systems and, and what we've done with that, um, that I think we're going to need to reckon with that nowadays in terms of, of how we how we raise um, how we raise meat that that we eat. Same thing's true with plants as well, though. I mean, this goes back to Aristotle's days. He cre credited animals, but not plants, with perception and awareness gained through the senses. Well, if you fast forward 2,400 years. Um, scientists have compelling evidence that plants possess states of aware perception and awareness gained through as many as 20 different senses, far beyond what the ancient Greeks knew. Vines and roots understand when they touch other things in their environment. Roots forage. There's a fabulous kind of studies that show roots foraging as a function of what they need in terms of minerals and moisture and so forth. Um, Leaves and stems, they see, uh, they see and they breathe. That's the whole process of photosynthesis, stomates opening and closing, uh, taking in carbon dioxide, using that as a way to, to make energy and so forth. Plants also smell, taste, talk, and listen in a biochemical language, all these phytochemicals we, we talk about. For instance, volatile compounds in a plant like sagebrush, <clears throat> um, plant gets eaten by an insect or an herbivore, large herbivore, the plant can release volatile compounds, volatile terpenes that alert its neighbors that it's been, that herbivores are present. So they increase their concentration of terpenes. That can also signal to insects that, hey, there's, there's, um, there's insect herbivores here. There's a meal over here. So there's all this smelling, tasting, talking, listening, this biochemical language that, that that's going on. So the point in that is then that eating is participating in endless transformation as plants and animals are killed and eaten. As I eat, the energy and matter in someone uh, becomes this entity I call me, the I am, which will in the flicker of a cosmic eye refer return to earth as plants and animals. And then our consciousness returns to the consciousness of, of being. In pondering these kind of mysteries, you may come to realize that all life is sacred. We're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, we do to ourselves. By nourishing them, we nourish ourselves. And I would say we do that by declaring love, not war on people and the landscapes we inhabit. And I know that can sound pretty naive. Um, when you look at world mythologies, the ones who persisted are the ones who declared wars and conquered everybody else. So, but I often think it, here in the US, when you look at the, the budget, the military budget for our country, if all that money that's spent on arming ourselves and, and, uh, and going to wars and stuff were spent on, on nurturing one another and the landscape to inhabit globally, it would be such a different world. And I know that that can sound like a, a very naive viewpoint, but I still, I think that all the time. Um, what if we did declare love, not war on people in the landscape to inhabit? And that's where that goes back to what Eckhart Tolle's talking about if you go further into that. That's going to require a transformation of consciousness in people globally that we to recognize that we are one community on one tiny little orb. All our tribalism that served us so well historically is probably not going to serve us so well even between now and mid-century, let alone to, to, the, to the end of the century. So I, I'd end on, on that note, Michael. Yeah, well, a lot you said a lot there. Um, and you know, of course I completely agree with uh yeah like you know what you ended off with especially is uh if we could you know one of the principles of regenerative ag that we talk about is um 
like a proper context and understanding of where you are relative to all sorts of things, you know, your understanding, your relationship with your family, all these in the context of your farm, right? And imagine if we change that one single understanding it, uh, and, and attempted to work with nature rather than than fight against fight against her and and how that would change everything uh you know simply that understanding that it's all interconnected right that we're interconnected with the plants the animals the insect the landscapes and how that could change uh change agriculture absolutely the case and then just to scale that globally to realize that our my life here in Innes is linked with with lives in Africa and China and where, wherever, huh? Sure. That, that we really are one one organism in a sense, not one super organism. Is uh, yeah, like you talk about spiritual dangers. Maybe the greatest spiritual danger is this illusion of our individuality in 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 the context of the biosphere, right? Of of the the whole the whole thing, the the planet the earth absolutely absolutely and it's, then the question is what can we can we wake up will we wake up and you know uh, sometimes you say well it'll be the end of the earth and i i, I don't think it'll be the end of the earth it, it simply no. could be as that that uh, as the video you had me suggested i watch you know it'll be the it'll be the end of humans on the planet we'll prune ourselves from the tree of life uh, so to right, speak. Right. but life isn't going to disappear from the the planet if we believe anything we've been taught about the last several billion years on this planet goes from one kinds of organisms to the next uh, the, the end of the dinosaurs issued in the age of mammals and here we are huh and so we see what comes next Right. Again, it's um, just another endless transformation of matter and energy. Right. It, and whether we're whether we're still part of that, you know, that that's uh, probably our decision to make. Right. We now we now have that power. Um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh. And then can we can we pull together to to uh, with the you know the huge. Uh, ecological, economic, and social challenges that, that we're facing now as a species where it's going to take uh, all of our, all of the cleverness we can muster. And then I think this transformation of, of consciousness to recognize that, that our fates are all intimately intertwined. Yep, absolutely. Well, you, sp you speak of consciousness and you mentioned uh, talking about plants and plants having intelligence. I'm slowly getting through a, a, a really great book I, like i haven't got through all of it but so far it's just been uh very interesting it's called plant behavior and intelligence by anthony i'm not sure how to pronounce the last name anthony truavis and it's uh, a, a great book where you know, it just lays out the the case for plants having intelligence and the ability to communicate and to deal with their environment and you know it starts with the fundamental um, kind of, you know, simple understanding that uh, when plants start to have issues, they can't just run away and find a new environment. So they have to communicate with their environment and try to find ways to adapt to, you know, it's too dry, it's too hot, it's all of these things. And they do that by communicating and, and having an intelligence to, to deal with their situation. So that's a uh, fabulous book, fabulous book. And, and as you say, boy, there's there's a tremendous amount of rigor that's gone into that into the research on all of this business. So when we're, we're saying that it's it's not in a flippant way at all. Uh, there was a book years ago came out, The Secret Lives of Trees. That was I found it fascinating, but boy, it received a lot of flack because it's, it's really you don't have the you don't have any data to support that uh, from the science community. It received a lot of flack, but boy, you pick up a book like like. Uh, the one that you're talking about and several others, which really was what I was thinking when I was talking there about plant intelligence. Uh, yeah, there, there's some incredible science that's gone in. It, it'll open your eyes to, uh, to, to the, what, what we're talking about. Yeah, like one of the criticisms, you know, it depends how you use the word intelligence, but, you know, the way we kind of define our own intelligence, it's sort of like a, a neural 
biological understanding and and you can say well plants don't have intelligence because they don't have neurons right well that's just one form of intelligence plants have a a different form of intelligence right like uh quorum sensing would be a good example of that right where where plants and and soul biology and and everything that's going on between that you know that relationship plants and soil and biology there's communication happening all the time at a at sort of like a biochemical level, right? They're not communicating the way you and I do, but they communicate in, in different ways. And, and that's, that's, a, right. that's they, a form of intelligence. That's right. They have a different language, huh? Right, exactly, a different they're, language. They're speaking, yeah. they're speaking in, in uh, the, uh, the, you know, the biochemical language, huh? And, and all these secondary yeah. compounds we talk about become very, very important um, nouns and verbs and adjectives and whatever you want to call it, but they're, Sure. They, they're, 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 that's the language that they're, they're communicating in. And even, you know, so we, all this, we've talked about plants may seem kind of just un, unimportant to agriculture, but once you have that understanding, how you raise plants completely changes, right? Your, uh, steward, your stewardship, your management, because, you know, these are intelligent um, organisms that, uh, uh, you know, it just it just changes everything. It changes how you relate to to that uh, living organism. Uh, absolutely, the the relationship, and that that's where the the consciousness transforms in that sense. Really, huh? your your awareness and appreciation and consciousness of that, uh, yeah, opens up to other dimensions and. and uh, yeah. And I think that, that that's all part of the, what I think is the, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we're at perhaps a turning point here in, 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 in how we do agriculture because of all this new information and, and, and understanding. And it's, you know, it's, you know, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be kind of a small part of, of that, like, like you've been and, and, um, and, you know, every producer who watches this video can, can be, a, a, you know, participate in this uh, transformation at a global level of how we how we feed ourselves absolutely absolutely the case good well i think that's a a, a great spot to leave it and we'll um we'll plan to do part six next week and that'll we'll wrap up our uh, winter webinar 